وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the great values of Islam can be found in other cultures, in other religions. Yet it seems that the more people are materialistic, the less this value is cherished by them. And we are talking about a very important portion of the community, a very important segment of the society that is found in all countries, nations, societies, and communities. We're talking about the elderly. If you go to Japan, to China, to Vietnam, to Cambodia, to East Asia in general, you'd find that they have a very important role for the elders and they respect them. They compete in serving them. Even by law, they are obliged to provide for them financially and mentally. But if you go to the non-Muslim countries in the West who are more engaged in materialistic matters, in capitalism, in gaining wealth over anything else, you'll find that they have homes for the seniors, for the elders, for the aging. They simply throw their parents, their grandparents in such homes and maybe send them a postcard every Christmas or New Year, and maybe not. And they would live there, die there, being unnoticed and uncared for. Those in Asia care for their elders due to their culture, their religion, and probably because they were brought up to do so, which is something natural. Islam is different because Islam makes this part of your religion, part of your religious commitment. You cannot be a true Muslim, a true believer, unless you have this in you. A man, an elderly, once came to the Prophet's gathering in the Masjid alayhi salatu wasalam, and the people did not give room to him. So they were reluctant in giving him due respect, in giving him space to sit down. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said in the authentic hadith, he is not from us who does not have mercy on the youngsters and respect the elders. The Prophet immediately والسلام, brought this to their attention. What you're doing is not part of Islam. He even highlighted how we should respect the elders and made that part of respecting Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet says والسلام, part of glorifying Allah is honoring the gray-haired Muslim. When a Muslim, when a Muslim's hair grows gray, this means that he had spent time serving Islam, living as a Muslim. Part of glorifying Allah Azza wa Jal is to give him respect and to honor him. And honoring him is to be soft and kind with him to honor him when he comes to a gathering. You show him respect by giving him a nice position to sit in. 
to have mercy over him. This is what the Prophet used to do, alayhi salatu was salam. Not only in Islam, even before Islam. He was known to be respectful to all. In the early times of Islam, one of the fierce enemies of Islam, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, his brother is Shaybah ibn Rabi'ah, his son is Al-Walid ibn Utbah, and they all fought against Islam. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah went to talk to the Prophet والسلام, to try and buy him off, to persuade him to leave this Islam or whatever he's calling for. And if he wants wealth, they'll give him. If he wants authority, they'll make him his, their king. If he wants women, they'll find the best woman for him. So the Prophet والسلام, was listening out of respect, did not interrupt did not attack by saying, do you think that I'm this kind of a man? Do you think I'm this or that? You are an imbecile, you're a mushrik, you're a... Ca Nothing. The Prophet heard him out. And when he finished, what did the Prophet say? He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, afaraghta ya abal walid. He nicknamed him. He did not say utbah because he was an elder person. So the Prophet addressed him, though the Prophet wasn't young himself. The Prophet ﷺ was in his mid-40s. So he said to him, Aba al-Walid, O father of al-Walid, are you finished? Then the Prophet ﷺ started to give his presentation. Also on the eighth year of Hijrah, when the conquest of Mecca was done, the Prophet was in Mecca, alayhi salatu wasalam. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, went and brought his father, Abu Quhafa. And Abu Quhafa was an old man in his 80s. So all of his hair and beard were white. When the Prophet saw him, he, in a sense, blamed Abu Bakr. And he said to him, Abu Bakr, why didn't you leave this old man in his house? I would have come to him instead of him coming to me and giving him all this trouble. This is the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Yet he is respecting the elders. And Abu Bakr said, by Allah, you are more entitled and worthy of people coming to you rather than you going to him, O Prophet of Allah. So we find that Islam honors the elders and it tells us to give them priority in food and drinks when they speak when they walk when we seek counseling and to take their opinion over something they have experience in this gives them pride when you show them that they are not worthless. Rather, they are valuable. And you're consulting them. And you are seeking their advice. And you are giving them priority over everyone else. This fills them with joy. Because they are at the end of their lives. And people at that stage often get despair they get sad and depressed. Islam tells us to uplift them positively and to treat them in a nice way. When they talk, they should, give, they should be given priority. There are hadiths where people came to the Prophet ﷺ and one of the youngest addressed him and the Prophet ﷺ would stop him and say, Kabbir, Kabbir meaning let the elders speak, not you. Though it was his right to speak, but Islam gives a priority to old age. And likewise, the Prophet ﷺ made his companions understand this. 
made it one of their characteristics. Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was in a gathering with the Prophet والسلام, in the Prophet's court. And the Prophet والسلام, as usual would throw puzzles, ask questions so that he would broaden the people's intellect and way of thinking. So he said, Allah Azza wa Jal gave us an example of a tree that is similar to a believer where its leaves do not fall to the ground. So the people in the Prophet's court started giving examples, guessing. Maybe it's this tree found in the desert. Maybe it's this tree found near the uh, coastal areas. And they started giving examples. Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, who was in his early teens, 14, 15 years of age, thought to himself that this must be a palm tree. And I wanted to speak out, but I saw Abu Bakr and Umar and all the elders, so I respected them and did not comment. This is how the companions were brought up. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, says, I stayed a whole year wanting to ask Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, about the interpretation, about the tafsir of an ayah, and I could not do so out of respecting him and fearing him. He wouldn't eat you. He wouldn't beat you. But this is the respect that we have towards the elders. The elders should also be given priority when serving them. And this is depending on the situation. But generally speaking, if I have people in the room and they're in front of me, or if I have someone with me, and I want to give something to one of them, I should give the eldest. The Prophet saw in a vision, alayhi salatu wasalam, that there were two men, and he wanted to give a miswak, this one. He wanted to give a miswak to the youngest, and he heard someone in the dream telling him, give the eldest, give the eldest. But scholars say, if I'm sitting down, and there are people to my right and to my left, I should start with my right, even if he was the youngest, because now we have a raw that we must follow the order of, the right before the left. But when they're random, they're not sitting, then I should begin with the eldest. Like, for example, if I enter a room and there are people sitting, they're not to my right or to my left. I'm the one serving them coffee. I'm the one serving them juice. I should go to the eldest. Unlike if I'm sitting down and they are to my right and left, I should start with the ones on my right. Also, we give them priority in leading the prayers. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the first one who's entitled to lead the prayer is the one who memorizes most of the Quran. Then the one who migrated first. If they were equal in memorization and in migration, then their eldest, the one who's older than the others, should be given priority to lead. Also, in Islam, we give priority to the elders in giving them salam. So many times we meet people on the streets and they look eye to eye, yet no one gives the salam first. Islam says the youngsters should give salam to the elders. This is what the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam. So make this your rule. Whenever you see someone who's older than you, you begin giving him salam rather than him wait, waiting for him to give you the salam. What about this gray hair that we grow as we grow older? Some people start to feel depressed because of it, because it shows them that they are near to their end, that their death is 
not so far away that was what was gone from the age and, and life is much more than what is left. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever grows old in Islam and he grows gray, it will become light for him on the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar. So why be depressed? This is the cycle of life. This is part of Allah's testing for you. This gray hair would become light on the day of judgment. And the Prophet ﷺ not only commented or complimented having white hair, he prohibited us from plucking it. <clears throat> Where he says that do not pluck these white hairs because it, will, it is the light of a believer. Now, not plucking it does not mean you must not dye it. On the contrary, it is part of the sunnah to dye white hair if you wish. And if you don't, there's no problem in that, inshallah. And part of your Islam to be good is to live long and to act good. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, to a person who asked him, which man is the best? So the Prophet said, a person who lives long are good. And this Quran, because this is their leader, this is their front, that they must choose the very best. Mus'ab says, can you demonstrate how one should be raising his hand to make qunut during which of prayer? Most likely it is this. And I hope the director gives us a, sh a closer look, the medium uh, camera. So it's like this. Some people in qunut, they, say, they do this. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. And some people are say lazy. You can't see my hands, but it's almost next to my belly doing this. No, the, the middle path is like this. And where should I look? Usually, you should look at the position of your prostration. If you look at your hands, if you gather them and you look at you, it's like someone's begging Allah Azza wa Jal. You know when you find a beggar in the street, you said, please give me something. Please give me some food. And Allah has the highest example. This is how we should to be moderate. And there isn't something fixed that you have to put it in. You have to widen the grip. It's something that you feel natural and easy with, and in all, inshallah, is accepted. Aisha says, the prescribed dua, ذهب الظمأ وابتلت العروق وثبت الأجر inshallah. Is this to be said before iftar or after eating or drinking something? What does this dua translate to? Thirst is gone, the veins are moistened and the reward is certain uh, uh, with the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this dua is to be said after you eat your three dates or five and drink a sip of water. This is when the hadith fits like a glove because the thirst is gone and you're not tired anymore. Your veins have been moistured with the food and the, the drink and the reward has been fixed inshallah and confirmed. So you say it after you eat and drink, not before that because when you say that the thirst is gone, how, how can it go if you did not drink anything? This is not logical. Aida says, I'm going to travel to a country which started fasting later than my country. Do I need to fast on the 30th day of Ramadan in that country? Assuming the country that I travel have 30 days of Ramadan and my total days of fasting would be 31 days or can I break my fast on that day. Either what counts is the country you're in. So Ramadan is on a Saturday, the beginning of Ramadan. 
Well, actually, in Saudi, it was on a Monday. I am in India on Sunday. I travel. I reach Sunday evening to Saudi Arabia. They say tomorrow is Ramadan. So I begin to fast with them. Why don't I postpone fasting till Tuesday? Because India, which I originated and came from, started fasting on Tuesday. Because the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the day of fasting is the day when you fast. And the day you break your fasting, that is of Eid, is the day you break your fast. What does that mean? It depends on the country you're in. You follow the community, not the country you came from. So by this, if I begin to fast on a Monday, which is the first of Ramadan in Saudi Arabia, and I fast 27, 28 days, and before Ramadan ends, in Saudi Arabia, it's still Ramadan. I traveled to India, who started to fast on a Tuesday. So they are fasting today and tomorrow and the day after. But I will be fasting more than Saudi, which I started to fast with. No problem. Because on that particular day that I went to India, are the Muslims fasting in India? Yes, it's Ramadan, then I have to fast with them. But Sheikh, I completed 30 days. And in Saudi, they fasted only 29 days, complete 30 days. Sheikh, they are fasting 31 days for me, where it is only 30 days for them. You have to fast 31 days. But Ramadan for you is only 30. So why do I fast this extra day? Because this extra day would count as voluntary, but it is par part of your Ramadan. Meaning that if you skip fasting the last 30th day in India, though you fasted your own 30 days, you would have skipped a day of Ramadan. But I fasted 30 days. Yes, but ask the people, is today Ramadan? They would say yes. Then you have skipped a day of Ramadan and you have to make that up. Hani. In Ramadan month, in my area where I live, the merchants take advantage of hiking up the price, such as from 100 kilo, they go up to 180 to 200 per kilo. The clothes from 2,500, they raise the prices to 3,500 because of the high demand. I do not agree at all. I would like to ask you, is it permissible to do like this? See, in Islam, it's neither capitalism nor communism or socialism. Prices are free. So it is up to the demand and supply. If I sell T-shirts and everyone else around me sell T-shirts, I can hike up the prices double, triple, or even quadruple. No problem on me. You are a customer, you come in and say, why is it so expensive? You leave and you go to somewhere else. It's demand and supply. There's no problem in that. The only problem is when I am the sole distributor, the only merchant that sells it. So you cannot buy any T-shirt elsewhere except in my shop. In this case, no, this becomes haram. Because now I'm controlling, I'm lobbying, I'm having this control over prices that harms the vast majority. But when everyone else has uh, 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 shops of their own, and they would probably go a little bit 10% below so that I can win the market, I see that I go 20%, there is competition, demand and supply, there's no problem in that, inshallah. Asif from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum. Sanatullah. Yes, sir. I have two questions. Yes, sir. The first question is regarding, uh, uh, you know, when uh, we, we are traveling, for example, I have a flight around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. in the morning, and uh, I have decided not to uh, do the fasting for the same day. So right from the morning, I can eat, or once I left my house, uh, I start journeying, then only I can uh, go for that. I can uh, start eating or something like that. Okay. 
And the second question is regarding uh, Zakat. You know, actually, I'm from India, and right now I'm residing in Saudi Arabia. So I have, uh, if I will go to my country, I can find many people. Uh, but since I'm away, uh, here, uh, can I give to some uh, my Zakat places like for Syria or, or Yemen or something like that? Uh, which one is a good way to go for, for Zakat? Uh, which zakat are you? M money, money, uh, money, yeah, or yeah, um, uh, yeah, financial like gold and uh, okay, not fitr, yani. Okay, exactly. Okay, exactly. Okay. Hayyak Allah. So, brother Asif had two questions. The first question is, when does a traveler break his fast? If I have a flight at twelve o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock, and I know that I have the concession to skip fasting. So I'm at my home. I'm traveling today, Thursday, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. If I wake up after Fajr, should I have breakfast and have lunch and act normally? The answer is definitely not. Why? Because you had not traveled yet. The concession was given to a traveler, and you're still a resident. You live in your home. So you have to fast until you're airborne. Once you, your plane leaves, then you are a traveler, you can. Or if your airport is outside the borders of your city and you leave the borders of your city, <coughs> if, and you leave the borders of your city, you are a traveler now. You can break a fast only then, not before that. His second question is about zakat. So. If I, ha I live in Saudi Arabia, my home country is India, and there are people in need of zakat, of food, in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, in Somalia, in um, Afghanistan, in um, elsewhere. So many impoverished people. In, in Kashmir, I know that they need a lot. So can I relocate my zakat? It's an issue of dip dispute. Some scholars say that zakat must be given, must be paid in the country you live in. And the most authentic opinion is that whenever there is a need, this is, it is permissible for you to dispatch your wealth because the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal where the Prophet والسلام, told him to tell the people of Yemen when he went to give them da'wah that inform them that Allah has taken portion of the wealth of the rich to be returned to their poor. Now, their poor, some scholars understood that it is the locals, those who are poor in that country itself. Others said, no, it means that from the rich of the Muslims to the poor of the Muslims, and this is wider understanding, and Allah knows best. And he says in Sahar, or in the pre-dawn meal, I was having tea in a plate as it was too hot to drink. While I was pouring it to, into uh, a, a cup or into a cup, I heard the adhan. I thought that the adhan started just now, so I drank a few sips and kept the remaining. Then I was in confusion whether my fast is still valid or not. I'm making serious repentance and make sure that it will not happen again, inshallah. Is my fast valid? First of all, tea is something to be drunk. So if you put it in a plate so that it becomes cold and you're holding both of them when the adhan was cold, when the adhan was cold, then in this case, you can drink. But if you put the tea in the plate and was waiting and all of a sudden you heard the adhan, the adhan announces the break of dawn. So if you know that the adhan is being called for fajr and the break of dawn, and yet you reached to the plate to drink a few sips of it, you have to make up for that day. Natasha or Natasha says, for someone who is in the interviewing process of marriage, what critical questions do you suggest to ask the potential spouse? You should ask the potential spouse about his reaction to a number of things that, so that you can know how he would react. You should ask him about the scholars he learns from, the lectures he listens to, so that you can have an idea about his aqidah, about his manhaj, about 
those whom he learns from. Uh, does he have a reference point that we can uh, refer to in terms or in cases of dispute? Uh, ask his friends, his relatives, his colleagues to tell you more about him. And so many things that you uh, can uh, do. And uh, Aisha says, can we say other duas along with Subhana Rabbi al Azim in obligatory prayers? Can I say different duas in different rak'ahs while doing rukur? Or it has to be the same? In rukur, it is not a place for dua. It's a place for dhikr. So you can say Subhana Rabbi al Azim wa bihamdih. You can say Allahumma laka raka'at wa bika amant wa laka aslamt khasha laka sam'i wa basari wa azmi wa mukhi wa asabi wa mastakallat bihi qadami. There are so many dhikrs that you can say. There's no problem. Can I make dua? Can I while in in ruku' after saying Subhana Rabbi Azim wa bihamdi? Can I say Allahumma ghfir li wa rahamni, Allahumma barik li, Allahumma pay off my debts, Allahumma guide my children. Can I do that? Some scholars say you can because this is part of the places of the dua, though there is not a single hadith that supports this like the one that supports making dua in sujood. So it's an issue of dispute. It's okay, but mainly speaking, I would recommend that you restrict rukur for dhikr. And there are so many types of different dhikr that the Prophet used to say. You can find this in the fortress of the Muslim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, do not say anything except after at least saying once, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. And then the sky is the limit. This is all the time we have. Until we meet, inshallah, on Saturday, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.